Hi, everyone. I'm Sid Maestri, VP of Developer Relations at API Matic, where we help companies with their API programs to drive higher developer adoption by taking an SDK first approach. So we basically help generate the code libraries, documentation, code samples, and everything that you need uh, for your developer experience. And today I'm gonna to be talking about unlocking the potential of code inside technical documentation. Basically, why is code so important to your documentation and your developer experience? Now, when I say documentation, uh, a lot of things will come to mind. Uh, maybe your API reference, your getting started, other guides or recipes, Maybe even your, your tutorials or your change log uh, when you think about documentation. And, and these are all, this is all correct. These are all part of your documentation, but a big element that is infused inside of this, because a lot of this is handwritten, this is text. We're communicating concepts and ideas, but a big part of it is the code that we intersperse inside of our documentation and how that actually communicates important information to the people who are reading your docs. Now, I found from a talk in 2016 uh, from Twilio that they did a user study and they found that the pages with less words before a block of code example actually performed better with their developer audience. And I thought that was a real interesting finding and this that, that study happened years ago, but it's still relevant to today. And for even further evidence of the importance of code in our docs, we don't have to look any further than the ubiquitous three column layout. And I was trying to figure out when did this even begin? When did we start to see this? So I went to one of the most well-known companies, Stripe, and I used the Internet Archive to look at screenshots of their developer docs throughout the years. And I found the first evidence of the three-column layout in August of 2013. So almost 10 years ago was the first time that they split their page up. And on the third column, they had different code examples with curl, Ruby, Python, PHP, Java. And if you look at different documentation sites today, this is just one example. This is Visa's Earthport in June of 2023. We still see this three column layout is being used by lots and lots of companies. I could show you dozens of examples, but I think we all agree this continues to be a popular pattern in displaying code within documentation. But I think code as a communication medium goes beyond just your documentation. We actually see it in a lot of the marketing around developer tools and products. I've taken screenshots of four different companies, Spotify, Ring Central, Vonage, OneSignal, and these are their developer portal home pages. This isn't their regular docs. This is how they are marketing their APIs and their developer tools to a developer audience by including code snippets in multiple languages to say to the developers, um, we can help you solve your problems. So that presents the question, why do developers love code so much? And the obvious, you know, we might obviously think, well, of course they love code, they're developers. But I think it goes a bit deeper than that because developers often identify with their community. If you are a Python developer, you see yourself and a little bit of your identity tied up with that language. If you're a 
Java or a JavaScript developer, you see yourself as part of that community and you have an affinity for your tribe. So when they land on your developer docs and they see a code sample in their preferred language, they see you as part of their tribe. And there's an affinity around that. And when you explain how to solve their problems in the language that they speak or the code, <laughs> the language that they program in, it's an opportunity to build trust and credibility. What you communicate to them through those code samples is, we understand your problem and we can help you. Now, that's provided the code sample is correct and runnable. And that's a, a very real challenge around inserting code into our documentation is that it's accurate and that when a developer takes it and tries to use it, it actually performs as expected. Now, a lot of folks with API programs will start by just exposing and the HTTP reference. How, you know, what is the endpoint? What are the methods? What's, what are the basic mechanics of how to authenticate? What's an example JSON request and response look like? So very agnostic, not really focused on any programming languages. And that is always a good first step. I don't think anybody skips should skip that step. But if you stop there, what you've done is you've left the developer to have to write all the code to handle all of these things to construct the arguments, to manage the authentication, which might involve setting, you know, encoding API keys and setting them in the headers in a specific fashion, to build the entire HTTP request, to serialize and deserialize JSON into their native language, and importantly, how to handle any error responses or failures that occur when communicating with your API, you've shifted the burden onto the developer. So if we can avoid that, we can actually help developers, you know, get to that hello world a lot faster and beyond into production. And as part of this talk, I thought of a podcast episode on API the Docs, where they dug into a, a study, an academic study about how developers learn about APIs. And they identified three archetypes, the systematic learner who wants to consume all the documentation from A to Z and really deep do some deep thinking about the problems they're trying to solve and understanding the entire system before writing a single line of code. And then there's the opportunistic learning style. And that's a developer who wants to understand and read as little as possible to understand the basic concepts of the API, but then they really wanna explore, they wanna experiment. What they're looking for are code samples and things, uh, tutorials, sample apps, things that they can pull into their IDE and start experimenting and playing around to see what's possible with your API. And then the third style is, pra is the pragmatic learner, who is a blend of both styles. And these styles are just that. They're preferences in learning style. And while they're not personality traits, it's how developers prefer to learn. And it can shift based on the context. If a really tight deadline is presented to a developer, they may not be able to take that preferred systematic approach because they need to get coding quickly and they need to get up and running quickly. If the priority for the project is that failure is not an option, 
we need a very robust solution, then maybe an opportunistic developer might slow down and take a more systematic approach. Now, you might be asking yourself, what now? How do I, how do I deal with this? I don't know the learning style of the, de the developers that are gonna arrive at my site and are reading these docs. I don't know the context of the project they're working on. Well, what that really says is you need to have those code samples. You need to have those tools available to support any kind of learning style. And that's really what we're going to look at next is what can we do to provide the code that they need, regardless of their learning style and the context they're working in. So if we're going to uh, add some code samples to our documentation, and we don't have them yet, the next logical question is, what languages do we need to support? And I've got a few tips on how you might approach that. Now, someone needs to write these code samples. And you might be a technical writer, but you're not an expert in any programming languages. So you need to find some engineers or developers to help you. So the first step might be to look to your internal engineering teams at your company to see if they can help with writing these code samples. And that means if they are JavaScript developers, they'll probably write JavaScript. If they're C Sharp developers, they'll probably write this code samples in that language. And that's an OK solution. Not Maybe not the best, but it, it can work. The next choice you have is to say, I just want, I can only have, I only have enough resources to create one code sample in one language. What language do I use? Well, if you look at a, a report or a survey on a company like Stack Overflow, you can get a list of the most popular languages today. And you know, the hint that I'll give you is, is probably JavaScript. Uh, it's a language that is widely uh, used by a lot of developers. We at API-Matic did our own survey of 100 SDK programs at 100 companies, and we found that 94% of the companies offered either TypeScript or JavaScript SDKs and code samples along with those. So that was the, the most popular and most widely supported. So if you can only have one language, I would go that route. The third way, and probably you know, we're getting towards the more the better way to do this is understand what your customers need, right? These are the developers that are most going to most likely going to benefit from these code samples because they are using your APIs. So if you're targeting mobile native mobile developers, then having code written in Swift or in Kotlin for Android developers, that might make sense. If you know that your developers skew towards the enterprise, maybe they're writing a lot of their code in Java. So understanding your developer community is important, but that can be kind of time consuming, going out and having those conversations or sending out surveys that maybe you get responses to or maybe not. So I'll mention a fourth way, which is a method I use to understand which languages are popular with our community. I looked at the actual API logs of our existing customers and examined the user agents inside of those API logs. We had a BI team that went and extracted all that information for me. And then I looked through those and I saw some of the you know handwritten SDKs that we had show up in those user agents. But then I saw all kinds of HTTP clients just dozens of them, to be honest. And I then took the time to understand, well, this client is a popular Ruby library. Uh, this one is a Java library. And I found, you know, over a half a dozen Java uh, HTTP clients represented in this. And then I counted out the number of unique users of each of these, and I had a spreadsheet. And from that, I was able to extrapolate the popularity of of different languages within our existing developer community, and I didn't have to talk to anybody. And that worked out really well for the company I was at. So 
those are just a few tips to get you started if you don't have anything uh, in place right now. But if you want to sort of skip that step and you aren't going to handwrite your code samples, there is a way to unlock the power of code, and that is through automation. And that's where API definitions, you might know them as Swagger, you might know them as Open API 3.0. Uh, specifications, that is where you can actually unlock the power of code by automating the building of your docs. And with those, with your docs, you get code samples with them. Now, the ideal code samples that you generate um, should be maintainable. They should have multiple languages supported. We want them to be runnable meaning a developer can copy and paste them into their IDE and it'll run as expected. Number four, they should be idiomatic. And when I say idiomatic, what I mean is the code is written in, a, in the style that is familiar to that developer community and follows the conventions of that language. So what the mistake that that I've observed is when you have a Java developer write all the code samples in all the languages, and so you end up with Python code that looks like it's been written by a Java developer and doesn't feel very natural and doesn't follow the conventions of the Python community. And so they might look at that code sample and be you know dissatisfied with the way it looks. So that's idiomatic. And then number five, production ready. And what I mean by that is it's robust. It's code that a developer would be comfortable in and excited to deploy into their production environment. And to evaluate some solutions, we're going to use those five criteria I just outlined. And we're going to look at three popular documentation tools and how they uh, sort of how they rank in these five different categories when automating the generation of code. So I'm going to escape out of this and head over to my browser. And the first example here, I've got our pet store API definition, which if you've played around with uh, Swagger or Open API, you've probably seen the pet store. And it's just a basic example where we've run this through Redoc. Now, I'll, I'll say that this is the free open source uh, project by Redockly. Redockly does have a paid product that has a lot more um, automation, a lot more robust code samples that it can generate. It's a bit more like README, which we'll look at next, but this is the free, um, this is sort of like the basics of what you would want to, want to have in your example. So, what I did was um, I, cr I uh, created my API spec. And inside of here, uh, you can see that we've got a pet where we have a name, we have a type, and we have an example of what the response would look like. And then over here, we've got a sample response and a sample request body. And I've handwritten a JavaScript and a Java example here that you actually embed inside of your API definition. So this code right here wasn't generated from the definition. It was actually the whole code sample is static and lives inside of my definition. And this works well if you've handwritten some SDKs and you need to add code sample code samples and you can't really generate the code samples easily because your SDKs are, are handcrafted. So you have to handcraft your code samples. So this is a way to incorporate that and automate the building of your docs with these code samples. Now, let's look at those uh, five criteria. Is it maintainable? Well, I just said that we have to statically create these and add them to our specifications. So if your API changes, you have to go in and manually update and test and make sure your code samples are accurate and then update your API definition with those code samples. So not really great for maintenance. Um, multiple languages, 
well, you can add as many languages as you want. So if you were only going to target one language, then this uh, redoc might work well for you. But if you are going to add, you know, six, seven languages, maintaining those multiple languages, you know, you can add them, but it might be kind of challenging. So uh, yeah, it supports multiple languages, but, but it just makes more, probably more maintenance for you. Is this code runnable? Well, yes and no. Um, there's, you'd probably need to have some kind of getting started guide that explains how do I even install the dependencies around this. Um, I can't just copy and paste this into my IDE because I haven't actually installed the Axios uh, dependency for this project. So th this can be like, it's most, it's kind of runnable, but not 100%. Now, is it idiomatic? Well, I would say that if I look at the Java example, one of the things that I notice in these um, HTTP snippets that um, a lot of companies will use in their documentation when they add code is that they aren't dealing with the objects uh, as native objects. They are dealing with, uh, in this example, a JSON body, which is just a, sh a string that has values substituted or concatenated in here. So if you think about a Java developer, they're gonna to wanna to have an object called pet, and they're gonna to wanna to have properties that they can set and get using uh, you know, that, native, uh, that sort of convention that Java developers are comfortable with. So you wouldn't really manipulate strings and um, be uh, inserting values into and doing string manipulation in this manner. So in this way, it's not really very idiomatic. And then production ready, um, I would say that it's probably not really that production ready because you know it's it's missing uh, our actual header here. I'm looking for the header, and I've not really seen a a place where it's got the header for our authentication. So this code probably wouldn't run successfully uh, and definitely wouldn't be production ready. So let's go to the second example here, which is readme.io, which is a little bit better in the sense that I get my full API reference here. So I've got my different methods and I've got my three column layout. And when I look at the five criteria for this, um, well, actually, before I go into the five criteria, I do want to point out that it does have this cool feature where I can start typing in uh, a name of my pet, and it actually updates my code sample here on the right. So I'm a big fan of this. Uh, someone asked me, would a developer actually use this to modify the code, or would they just do it inside of their IDE? Um, I think they would probably just use their IDE, but this is a nice way to get hands-on and experiment with uh, modifying the code before you've gotten to that step. So you can actually ex you know, explore it within inside of the docs. Um, now, you can choose different languages up here. So I can choose Java. I can choose Node. Uh, this is a nice little step here. For Node, they actually have the installation of the dependency. It kind of tells you to do that before you use your request. So I like that. Um, it allows me to set my authentication. So I've got my bearer token set. You can see in the code it's being set for me. So this is definitely uh, a step up from Redoc and it's all being generated dynamically. This isn't happening inside of um, our API definition. This code doesn't, doesn't exist anywhere. It's all being created for us um, when we um, import our API definition. So very maintainable. Uh, as far as programming languages, uh, definitely an A plus because look at all these programming languages. I mean, this is great. We've got Swift, we've got Kotlin, we've got R even, Go, Clojure. So we've got all these different languages supported out of the box. Uh, is it runnable? Um, haven't tested it myself, but I'm gonna assume, I can see the authorization headers being set. I'm assuming that this is gonna be runnable. I can copy and paste it. Once I get those dependencies installed, I can run it. Um, is it idiomatic? Well, this is a Java example. And you know, again, 
they're sort of missing the mark here on being idiomatic because again we're we're doing string manipulation when a object oriented strongly typed language like java would expect you to have full models built out of each object that you would then interact with so not quite idiomatic and then production ready I'm not seeing any error handling here. And that's a big thing is you want to make sure that you have like a try catch block. Um, you want to have a way to deserialize your object and put it into a native object. You want to be able to capture those error objects and then understand is it a 200? Is it a 400? Is there any unique custom messages that are uh, error messages that are being returned? So we're sort of missing that. And, what happens if we fail uh, to make the API call successfully? Will it do a retry? So I'm not really seeing any of that. And then our third example is API-matic. Uh, so as I mentioned, I work for API-matic, so we'll we'll get that uh, we'll get that disclaimer out of the way. But I I, I just want to talk about the sort of how it goes uh, above and beyond the examples we've seen today. We've got. Uh, our HTTP reference, which everybody should have, we talked about that. Uh, but then we've got these different languages here that we can select. So if I choose Java, when it reloads, all the documentation, including the tutorials, have all been updated to reflect the language that I've selected. So this step-by-step -step tutorial tells me how to actually set up my project and get it up and running. And these screenshots are not sta static. They're actually SVG files. And so it updates the name of my library to pet store Java. So it actually would be customized based on your API uh, definition. All of these screenshots would be updated as well. And when I go into the different endpoints, and for example, I click on create pet, I now see that we've got a similar interface to README where I can change the name of the pet and the code changes. I can select, uh, you know, cat. And again, the, the uh, code changes here. And let's just go through those five criteria. Is it maintainable? Uh, yep, all of this code is being generated dynamically. Multiple languages. Well, yep, I showed you we've got uh, six different languages. Actually, API-Matic is getting ready to release Go as their seventh language that they support. Uh, is it runnable? Now, this is a, one of the cooler features is you can click on this configure button. I can type in my uh, access token, and then I can click on show complete file. And when I do that and I expand it, we get all of our package information, our import statements, uh, a program class with a main method. So this is how you would run this code in Java locally. If I just wanted to execute the code, I can actually copy and paste this into a class and I can just run the whole thing. Um, is it idiomatic? Um, yep. When we, have an, uh, when we set our JSON object, we're doing it as a new pet. And that is going to be something we could set each of those values on. And is it production ready? Well, yeah, you've got a whole SDK behind this. And it's got error handling, exception handling. It does validation. So if you tried to pass in a value that, um, or you omitted a value, it would catch that error. It would throw an error for you telling you that uh, you you didn't pass in the right values into your object. So there's validation and additional error handling that you get when you have a full SDK code library behind the code samples that you're providing. So let me jump back to the presentation to just wrap this up. So really, when you go to that step of automating your code samples that you have as part of your documentation, it's really a choice between having these HTTP snippets or full-blown SDKs that are sitting behind those code samples. Um, the code samples themselves need to have 
something behind them, some kind of library. So is it just a, a plain HTTP client or is it a full blown SDK? And I'll just touch on the advantages of SDKs uh, to make sure that you know, you're aware of the big differences. One is you're gonna get the full authentication uh, built into your SDK. So if you're using something like OAuth 2 and it's like a three-legged OAuth uh, where a user has to consent, that's a much more complicated authentication flow and providing an SDK to developers means they don't have to figure that out on their own. Providing robust data models is going to align with the idiomatic style of strongly typed languages. Data typing on, on those models so that I don't try to set a string when the data type is an integer. Um, you wouldn't get any of that validation with the JSON string manipulation approach. Uh, additional validation error handling on the request and response to the API. Importantly, being able to recover from API failures. So if it fails, do you have a mechanism for retrying the API call? Uh, if you keep making API calls, do you have a circuit breaker that then, if you've tried it five times, would it then you know, error out or would it keep trying? Uh, also, language-specific documentation that is written specifically for that language. I had that experience of releasing SDKs only to have developers come back to me and say, hey, where's the documentation for this SDK for specifically this language? And then something we maybe don't think about is that when you have a full SDK and you import it into your IDE, you get autocomplete, code complete, code hinting. So I could type in, you know, pets controller dot, and it would show me all the methods that are available for interacting with the pets API endpoint. So it makes it easier. Developers don't have to jump back and forth to your documentation and then back to their IDE. So the code actually becomes, uh, the documentation uh, kind of goes along with the SDK code. So with that, uh, I hope you enjoyed the talk and understand a little bit better about how you can unlock that power of code inside of your documentation uh, by taking different levels of uh, integration and um, meeting those five criteria of maintainable, multiple languages, runnable, idiomatic, and production ready. And thanks for joining me today.